Hi all, this video is an intro to inverse functions. So before we get into the inverse functions part, I actually want to make sure we're really clear on two more basic ideas. Just what does it mean for something to be an inverse? And in order to understand that, we have to know what it means for something to be an identity. So I have some very informal definitions of these things, just working definitions for us. In general, if you're claiming something is an identity, that means that it will leave things unchanged. If you apply an identity to something else, it doesn't change that thing at all. Inverses, uh, our basic idea is defined in terms of an identity. So an inverse should undo the, the effect of some operation that we're looking at, meaning that when you apply uh, an inverse to something, it should leave you with the identity. So this is our basic working idea. Identities don't change things. Inverses will uh, negate the effect of some operation, returning us back to an identity. Okay, so just to do some warm-up examples, I would like to look at addition and multiplication of real numbers first, and then we'll get right into functions after that. So if we are adding two real numbers, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, what is an identity if we're adding real numbers? So what could I add to any real number that would leave it unchanged? And the answer is zero. If I add zero to any real number, it does not change it. I get back exactly what I started with. Now that I know what an identity looks like when I'm adding real numbers, I can talk about what an inverse would be. So the question is, what can I add to a real number that will undo the effect of the addition and get me back to our identity zero? The answer is I need to add the opposite of A. So whatever A is, I add its opposite, and that should get me back to zero. So notice we've chosen what we're working with, we're working with real numbers. We've chosen an operation, addition, and there is one single identity thing that we are working with. Every single real number will have its own inverse. So depending on whether you're starting with two or negative five or one third, each of those has its own inverse. If we're multiplying real numbers, we're thinking of still working with the same things, real numbers, but now the operation is multiplication, so it's going to change things a little bit. So the first question is, what is my identity? What can I multiply A by that will not change it? The answer is 1. If you multiply any real number by 1, you still have the same number. Now that we've identified our identity, we should be able to pick out what inverses look like when we're multiplying real numbers. So the question becomes, what can I multiply a number by that will undo the effect of the multiplication and get me back one, my identity? And the answer is reciprocal. So if you add things with opposite signs, uh, they wipe each other out and get you back to zero. If you multiply reciprocals, they wipe each other out and get you back to our identity one. Okay, so now we need to work our way up, let me cover here, to thinking about real valued functions. So we don't wanna just think about real numbers, we wanna think about functions. We have a function that we're inputting real numbers and outputting real numbers from. Uh, just to get us started right away, there's a little notation that goes with inverse functions. So if we're talking about the inverse of a function f of x, we would write it like this. So this little negative one exponent applied only to the function name means inverse. We don't want to confuse that with the negative one exponent that actually means reciprocal. So if I want to say the reciprocal of f, I would write it like that, and that means 1 over f of x. If I want to say the inverse of x, I put the negative 1 right next to f, and that means inverse. So these are definitely not the same thing. Kind of unfortunate that the notation is similar, but you want to be really clear on what's reciprocal and what's inverse. Okay, so the next big question that we have to answer, we've decided that we're working with real valued functions. We've got some notation that we're going to use for what an inverse function is. We have to decide what operation we're using. So when we were working with real numbers, we had addition, we had multiplication, we could have tried others and come up with identities and inverses. 
And you can do a lot of those same operations on functions. You can add functions, subtract, multiply, divide. The one we're really interested in is composition. So we want to talk about uh, what will be the inverse of a function if we compose them together. Last little piece before we can really get into what it means for functions to be inverses is we have to figure out what the identity is. So once we know what the identity function is, we'll know that that's what we want to get when we put two inverses together. Okay, so the identity function has to be the function that leaves things unchanged. So we're looking for a function, I'm going to call it i for identity, that whatever we plug into it, it doesn't change it. That function is actually y equals x, i of x equals x. So our identity function is just y equals x. <clears throat> So this leads us to our first big fact about inverse functions. So here's the big deal to remember, uh, what it means to be inverses. Two functions are inverses if composing them leaves you with just plain old x or whatever variable you were starting with. So if I take the function and I plug the inverse into it, they should undo everything that uh, the other one does and we should be left with just x and it should work if I go in the other direction as well. If I plug the function into the inverse, I should be left with just plain old x when I'm done. <clears throat> there can be some domain restrictions on this. This is composition, so there can be a restriction on f inverse here or on f here. So I have a little bit of extra written into this note that says this should be true for all x in the domain of the inner function. So this might not actually hold if we step outside domain restrictions for f inverse or f, and that is okay. Okay, that's my intro video. I'll post others with some examples. Thanks for watching.